This humble rock transformed Britain and Yorkshire into the workshop of the world. So join me on this rather wet and dismal day in the National Coal Mining Museum as I look at this part of Yorkshire's hidden history. As you can see, the vast majority of the coal field covers western South Yorkshire, although there's a very tiny coal field in North Yorkshire called the Ingleton coal field. There's been coal mining in Yorkshire since the Roman times, but for most of that time it was only used locally to either heat homes or for local manufacturing. Most of these pits were called bell pits, which is where miners would simply dig up the coal on the surface in a shallow pit. They couldn't really dig deep mines because they ran into a huge problem, water. Water would always come into the mines and they had no way of getting it out. That is, until the invention of the Newcomen steam engine in 1712 which allowed water to be pumped out of the mine and shafts to be dug deeper, thus allowing more coal to be extracted. John Smeaton from Leeds, known as the father of civil engineering, improved this machine and made it even better than before. In the mid-18th century came the Industrial Revolution, which, to keep it simple, was basically a boom in Britain's industrial creativity and output. Suddenly, almost every single industry with all these new factories and steam engines needed coal to power it, and Yorkshire was ready and willing to supply it. Britain's yearly coal output went from around 5.2 million tonnes in 1750 to 62.5 million tonnes in 1850. Yorkshire was actually quite slow in terms of its coal development compared to other places like the North East. This is because he had a lack of water transport links. Before the invention of the railways, the waterways were really the only way to transport coal around and Yorkshire didn't really have any. But that all changed with the creation of the Leeds-Liverpool Canal, which I've already made a video on, which you can check out afterwards. With the creation of this canal, Yorkshire coal could now be shipped to the cotton mills in Lancashire, to the ports in Liverpool, it could be shipped to all the major industrial areas of the north. It was the Yorkshire coal which helped build Britain. But for all these industrial achievements, it was done under extremely exploitative labour in some of the most deplorable and dangerous conditions. In the mid-Victorian era, in no West Yorkshire coalface could you actually stand upright. In all of them, you had to stoop or crawl on your hands and knees to the coalface in a hot, smelly, wet and dangerous environment. Not to mention claustrophobic. In the Victorian times, some miners would take off all their clothes as they worked, covered completely in black coal dust. Sometimes they worked alongside naked women and girls. Sometimes the entire family would be working together in the mine. The only light they'd have in the otherwise pitch blackness was cheap candles, but these could prove extremely dangerous. This is because in the mining process, dangerous gases like methane, otherwise called fire damp, would be released, and because these mines weren't ventilated, they had nowhere to go but stay in the mine shaft. When in contact with the naked flame, they could go boom. Although safety lamps had been invented, a lot of miners didn't use them as they didn't give off as much light as candles and they're often quite expensive. One inspector recorded that between 1851 and 1877, 1,126 miners in Yorkshire alone died from explosions in mines. Another inspector recorded that between 1851 and 1881, over 3,200 Yorkshire workers died in accidents in mines. At the Oaks Colliery explosion in Barnsley in 1866, 361 miners and rescuers died, becoming the worst mining accident in England. A common way of searching for gas in a mine was to bring in a canary in a cage. Because they're more sensitive to these gases than humans, they'd pass out if they encountered these gases and give the workers a chance to escape. Now at this point you might be wondering how they actually got oxygen so far deep underground. And in the early days what they'd do is simply build a fire at the bottom of one of the shafts and the fire would draw oxygen down into the fire from the surface, but later on they began to create big machines which would fan and pump air into the mine, like this one here. It wasn't until 1842 that children under 10 and women were banned from working in the coal mine, but even after the law was passed, 
we still have evidence of children under 10 working there. And if you're 11 or 12, well, you are still fair game, because it wasn't until 1901 that the minimum working age was raised to 12. One account from Halifax tells us that children would pull loaded carts of coal weighing hundreds of pounds through tunnels which were no more than 16 to 20 inches in height. They'd often start work at eight years old, but some were as young as five. Often the youngest children would be trappers, and personally this is the most terrifying job. You sit in utter pitch darkness for 12 hours a day, opening and closing doors. It sounds simple, but it was so boring that if you fell asleep, it could be incredibly dangerous. Earlier today I went on a guided tour of, of the coal mine, and we experienced a total and utter totally enveloping darkness which these children would sit in and it was terrifying. You'd be hearing the scurrying of rats and dreadful for a child to go through. In 1838 at Huskar Pit near Barnsley, 26 children, some as young as seven years old, were drowned when a stream flooded the mine. This shocked the nation and Queen Victoria ordered an inquiry which formed the basis of the 1842 Mines Act which banned children from under 10 years old from working in the mines and from women working as well. When children were no longer allowed to pull these heavy loads, they used horses instead. As time went on, they began to use all manner of different machines to dig the coals, but that's not really my forte, so we're going to skip forward to the 20th century. In 1929, the South Yorkshire coal field reached its peak when it mined 33.5 million tonnes of coal in one year, providing 13% of Britain's coal output that year. South Yorkshire had one of the finest coal seams, the Barnsley Bed. During the Second World War, 36,000 miners left to join the armed forces, meaning that Britain would soon suffer a fuel crisis if it couldn't find replacement labour. Without coal, trains and ships couldn't run, houses would have no fuel and industry would grind to a halt. Britain would almost certainly lose the war. The Bevin boys were created. 10% of all conscripted men were sent to the mines, a total of 48,000 from December 1943 onwards. Although a lot of these men deeply resented not being able to join the armed forces and getting involved in the fighting, their work was essential for the war effort. Their hard work and toil ensured that Britain had enough power for the rest of the war. British coal production peaked in 1913 at 287 million tonnes, but it was on a road of decline, and this is where we come to the end of British coal mining. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it at all, in fact. I think it's too recent, it's too raw, and it's too emotional a topic. You can still feel the effects today in some communities. It devastated some communities. It led to a loss of traditions and a way of life and a loss of heritage. And I know some people would like me to go into the 70s and 80s, but personally, I just I just want to leave it here. So I'm going to end with a tribute to Yorkshire and British coal industry, history and heritage. <laughs>